you uh, have your Bibles with you this morning, if you'll uh, begin to work your way over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to begin a new uh, chapter study this morning. And I guess a lot of people got my email because generally uh, we, we have a few more people than we normally have, but given the subject matter, <laughs> uh, I knew this was going to uh, potentially be a... A uh, segment of scripture uh, that, that, that pricks, uh, that stabs, but I also want to let everybody know that it's a, it's a passage of scripture that encourages, uh, that heals, that provides stability for the church. Uh, this morning, we are going to be moving from uh, the generalities that Paul has been discussing in reference to the Corinthians' attitudes to now dealing specifically with certain behaviors uh, that Paul is going to be addressing over the next few chapters. Uh, today in chapter 5, he's going to be dealing with uh, church discipline uh, within the context of sexual immorality. And that's why I've entitled this chapter, Tough Love, Tough Love. As we go through this, we need to set the context for this. Uh, what is church discipline? Why should a church even engage in this thing called church discipline? Well, church discipline, according to some well-known pastors, uh, one John MacArthur, uh, in reference to church discipline, he writes that church discipline is vital to the spiritual health and to the testimony of the church. Ignoring church discipline is the most visible and disastrous failure of the church in our time because it conveys to the world that we're not really serious about sin. Dr. Albert Moeller, who is the president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, uh, in one of his uh, writings in, in the journal articles that where he wrote, he says, quote, Without a recovery, recovery of functional church discipline, Firmly established upon the principles revealed in the Bible, the church will continue its slide into moral dissolution and relativism. Authentic biblical discipline is not an elective, but a necessary and integral mark of authentic Christianity. And so those are two uh, well-known uh, pastors who are making those statements in our contemporary time. And yet many churches today uh, do not exercise church discipline in reference to that. And there's a whole host of reasons why. Uh, and it all began really back at the early part of the uh, 20th century uh, as liberalism began to creep into the church. And then by the 20s, 30s, and 40s, uh, you had virtually no church discipline being exercised. Whereas in the 1700s and in the 1800s, up through the Civil War period, church discipline was really something that was indicative of, of most denominations. Now, the Southern Baptists weren't around before the 1850s, but there were Baptist churches there. It was reported among, amongst one Baptist congregation uh, in Georgia that within the uh, conglomeration of churches in Georgia that over 40,000 people uh, experienced church discipline in one year. If that were to happen today, that would definitely be making uh, the newspapers with this church, these churches that seem to be, uh, you know, holding people accountable. Uh, the way it would normally work back in the 1700s, because they didn't uh, meet at church every Sunday. Generally in the more rural areas, uh, they would have church once a month. And what would happen is that the church uh, body the ruling elders and, uh, would come together the weekend before the church service and any matters of discipline were dealt with then and were then made public to the churches. Uh, and generally the way that people were brought up on, on some type of a violation of a biblical standard or ethic, if you will, is that most of them uh, confessed that and repented of that to the church leadership uh, at that time. And so that's just to give you a little insight about how things were done in the 1700s, 1800s. Again, we don't really exercise church discipline according to, to that standard uh, today that, that was exercised back in those days. It's virtually non-existent in most denominations and in most churches today. Uh, 
but it shouldn't be. One pastor of the 1700s into the 1800s, John L. Dagg, who was a great Baptist theologian, said, when discipline leaves the church, Christ goes with it. Meaning if the church fails to deal with open rebellion and sin amongst the members of the congregation, uh, if nothing is done, then that, that sin spreads like cancer. To the extent that the church ceases to be able to function in, in its capacity uh, to bring people to Christ as well as to encourage and teach the saints. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Tough love. We're going to see as we go through this chapter, Paul is going to begin by talking about a scandal. We'll look at this in just a minute. We see that in verses 1 and 2. And then Paul is going to issue a sentence. In other words, he's going to tell the congregation what they should do in order to deal with this erring brother. Uh, in verses 6 through 8, Paul will tell us the standard. That is, if we're going to be dealing with sin issues in the church, then we have to have some type of objective standard on which to make an appeal in order to correct the behavior. Paul does that in verses 6 through 8. And then in verses 9 through 13, Paul gives us the solution. That is, how we as a body should uh, deal with uh, this issue of church discipline. So follow along with me as I read. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. Paul writes, It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, and immorality of such kind is not, does not exist even among the Gentiles that someone has his father's wife. And you have become arrogant and have not mourned. Instead, in order that one who had done this deed might be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, Though absent in the body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has committed this as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting is not good. You do not... Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover has also been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not mean... I did not at all mean with immoral people of this world, or with the covetous or swindlers, or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he should be an immoral person, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reveler, or a drunkard, or a swindler, not to even eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. Well, let's pray. Our Father and our God, as we come to the passage this morning, we seek for uh, the Holy Spirit's wisdom and insight in uh, determining and examining this passage. Father, help us uh, as we examine our own lives. Help us to understand uh, how you have instituted discipline as a means for which to maintain purity in the church. And we just pray, Father, that if there's uh, someone here this morning who's outside of a salvific relationship with you, even though this is a message for God's saints, that through the teaching and the preaching of the word, if it be within your divine providence, Father, that you would see fit to draw them to yourself. And we ask and, and thank you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So Paul begins this chapter specifically by talking about a scandal. The scandal that he has in mind is that there is a specific sexual sin in the church. Paul says, for I've been informed concerning you, my uh, brethren, by Chloe's people. Now he writes that over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 11. Uh, in other words, if Paul says he's heard that there's sin and immorality in the church, well, where did he get this information from? 
Well, he gets it from those members in the church from Chloe's house who apparently have informed Paul as to the extent of what's going on into the church. Now, the sin specifically that he's dealing with has to do with an improper sexual relationship. Now, the word uh, immoral uh, comes from the Greek word pornea, from which we get our English word pornography. And it can mean all types of uh, illicit sexual conduct and behavior outside of the marriage covenant. In this context, this immorality that Paul describes has to do with a man having his father's wife. Now, more likely than not, this is, does not mean that this person is having some type of ongoing promiscuous relationship with his biological mother. More likely than not, what has happened is that this young man has now attached himself in a sexual relationship with a female uh, who used to be his father's wife. So it could be his stepmother. MacArthur notes, in the case, it was a form of incest, even though it's not his real biological mother, because the man was living with his father's wife, that is, his stepmother. The term father's wife indicates that the woman was not his natural mother, but had married his father after his mother had died or been divorced. That God considers such a relationship incestuous is clear from the Old Testament. Sexual relations between a man and his stepmother was in the same category as relations between him and his natural mother. So that, that's how we define the context, or Paul is defining the context for explaining how this relationship and why this relationship is immoral. Consider, for example, Leviticus 18, verses 7 and 8, under the Mosaic Law. Moses writes, you shall not uncover the nakedness. Now that's a figure of speech to mean you shall not engage in sexual relations. So he says, you shall not engage in sexual relations of your father, that is, the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother. You are not to uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your father's nakedness. And then over in Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 20, Moses again writes, Cursed is the one who has sexual relations with his father's former wife. Now that's the appeal on which Paul uses to uh, say that this relationship in Corinth is immoral. He says, Cursed is the one who has sexual relations with his father's former wife, for he dishonors his father, then all the people will say, Amen. Even... Paul says that this relationship that's going on in the church is not even named or mentioned among the Gentiles. So he's, he's even talking about even the people in Corinth are saying, man, this is a pretty bad sin. And there was a euphemism or a figure of speech back in those days where if a person uh, acted in a very immoral style of behavior, uh, people would say that that person has been Corinthianized. You know, and so this sin was so bad that even Paul is saying, even the Corinthian folks are saying, you are way past being Corinthianized. Uh, under Roman law, even this type of relationship would not have been acceptable. One Roman commentator, Gaius, uh, in AD 161 said, it is illegal to marry a father. It is illegal to marry a, a father's or mother's sister. Neither can I marry her who has been formerly at one time ever my mother-in-law or stepmother. So what he's saying then is that the, the Greek mindset rejected this. The biblical law prohibited this. This is a serious type of sexual sin. And it's going on right there in the church. And so that leads him to address the second sin. Because there's actually two sins going on here. One is with the young man who's engaged in this ongoing promiscuous relationship with his stepmother. The second sin is the fact that the congregation, the saints of the Lord Jesus Christ, is doing nothing to address it. They're doing nothing to address the sin. Look at verse 2. And Paul says to the church, and you have become arrogant and have not mourned. Instead, in order that the one who had done this deed might be removed from among your midst. MacArthur again. Yes, sir. James, one question. 
They did not go after the woman, so you'd have to think that she was either not a church member or not a Christian. That is correct. she was probably alive at the time. Yeah, Jimmy said uh, it seems that Paul is being heavy-handed with this young man and nothing's really being said about the woman. Uh, and the reason is, is more likely than not, this woman was an unbeliever. Uh, Paul will again address toward the end of this chapter uh, the distinction between church discipline and reference to those who are born again, professing believers in Christ versus those who are unconverted. Uh, and he'll say that we are to judge those within the church. God is to judge those outside of the church. So good question. Now, in reference to this uh, church body not addressing the issue, MacArthur notes that they, that is the church, was so self-satisfied and self-confident that they excused or rationalized the most wicked behavior within the congregation. Perhaps they looked on the incest as an expression of their Christian liberty, or perhaps they looked on their toleration of it as an expression of Christian love. <clears throat> In any case, their arrogance blinded them to the clear truth of God's standard. And that's why Paul is so harsh in his tone with this congregation. And not just them, but even over in Ephesians, for example, he tells the church, don't let immorality or any impurity or greed even be named among you as is proper among the saints. And do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. And the problem with this church is they weren't exposing the unfruitful deeds of darkness. You had a question, Paul? There are some commentators that state because of this young man's status, perhaps, and this is pure speculation, but you're absolutely right, that because of his social status within the church, there were those in the church who, did, who felt it wasn't their place to address him uh, and to put it in our vernacular because, you know, he's one of the founding members or perhaps his father was one of the founding members of the church or perhaps he's a big tither and we don't want to upset the big tithers around here because we don't want that money leaving the church and going down to the First Presbyterian Church down the street. So that's that could be something that's a viable solution. However, the text itself doesn't state why. But the problem is still the same. The problem still has to be addressed, and Paul is addressing with the church by saying, you don't even expose them in their sin. That's the scandal, a two-pronged sin, if you will. The sin of immorality and the sin of complacency. And then Paul deals the sentence. You have to remember, Paul is not there physically with him. He's writing them uh, back this letter. But he understands the situation of what's going on. Paul isn't present with him, but he's already judged their sin. Paul states that the unrepentant believer is to be removed from the church and handed over to Satan. That is, he is to be removed from the church and handed over to Satan. Now, this is a difficult one. And I'll tell you why it's difficult. Because we don't see this in the church today. We don't see removal of people from the church today. We'll see things like, you know, we're going to remove them from the role. Or we're going to talk to them and just uh, basically we'll extend the right hand of fellowship. And we'll just hope that eventually at some point they'll come to their senses and repent. That's generally how most churches deal with this issue of discipline. Yes, sir. Yeah. And, and now, there are faithful men. You mentioned that in Tony Evans' church, uh, the, the church uh, eldership and body exercise church discipline against someone by removing them from the church. Uh, that's not to say that all churches do this. There are definitely godly pastors and elders in churches all over the country. But as a whole in this country, uh, we don't really see this type of discipline uh, being uh, administered. Uh, Dr. Bruce Compton, uh, who is a professor of uh, Bible Languages and Exposition at the Southern Baptist Seminary, writes, quote, In short, Paul calls on the readers to expel the incestuous man from the church and to expose him to the hardships of Satan rule and activity. 
Paul's intent is that through Satan's attacks and the shame of public censure, the incestuous man will be led to renounce his sinful ways. And again, we need to keep in mind the context of why we're administering or why the church is to administer church discipline. It's not punitive. In other words, we're not putting someone in the spiritual jailhouse in the back or putting them in the public stockades in the square so that people can walk by and say, shame, shame. This has nothing to do with some type of civil uh, uh, proceedings in reference to how we would identify those who were criminals, if you will. Uh, this is an in-house form of discipline for the saints of God with a view to restoration and repentance, and it is not punitive. So when we're talking about discipline, how, do, how should the approach be made on this individual? Um, well, we already see it in the context of the scriptures. Uh, Jesus tells us in Matthew 18, we are to confront a sinning brother or sister in Christ. Uh, if that doesn't work, and we've gone to him a couple of different times, and they say, you know what, I hear what you're saying, eh, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to continue to do whatever I want to do, then the very next step is excommunication, which means to break fellowship, specifically within the context of breaking fellowship over communion. They are not to participate in the Lord's table. And then another facet of, uh, of uh, church discipline is physical death. Again, we said last week the church is not to stone the individual uh, or what have you, but that God within His divine providence and prerogative may take the life of the individual um, in order to keep that person from shaming the name of Christ and bringing reproach on the church. So, let's get back to excommunication. Those are the forms of church discipline. What we're seeing in the context of this passage is excommunication. What he's talking about is removal from the fellowship of the church. Paul says specifically, turn the man over to Satan, so Satan will destroy his physical life. Now, God uses Satan to accomplish his divine purposes. Paul says that this is part of the divine side of the church discipline process. There's the human side and then there's the divine side. Of an unrepentant believer, uh, it may come, come down to the case to where a believer must be removed from the fellowship of the body and turned back over into the world. Because that's of their own choosing. And then what Paul is saying is that what's happening theologically is that this man or this, this sinning Christian is going to be turned back into the world to basically, so for basic, uh, the basic reason that Satan may have his way with him. Now we see this, for example, over in the Old Testament. There's many cases of it in the New Testament as well. Uh, Paul says that, that the Lord gave uh, uh, a demon, if you will, to, to keep him humble so that, uh, uh, so that he wouldn't end up exalting himself. But in the Old Testament here, a good example we see of this is over in the book of Job. Uh, you'll recall that uh, Job went through a lot of hard times. He lost his family. He lost his health. Uh, he had three friends uh, that came to him, and uh, some of them, most of them gave him not so good advice. But uh, Job was vindicated in the end, and God was vindicated at the end that uh, Job uh, did not curse God, which is what Satan said he was going to do. But in one of these tests, Satan comes before God, and God enters into this cosmic contest, if you will. Without turning there, because I have it up here, consider this. This is uh, Job chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. So apparently, the scene in heaven is this. Uh, the angels of the Lord come before God and to present themselves, presumably for praise and worship, and it says, And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. So here it is. The devil comes up before God. Now God is the one who, who introduces this contest. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. And Paul will go on to later say, seeking those whom he may devour. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man fearing God and turning away from evil. 
and he still holds, holds fast his integrity, although, although you indi uh, incited me against him to ruin him without cause. And this was over in chapter 1. Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. However, put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your power, only spare his life. So here we see that God is telling the devil, Okay, look, you can go out. You're saying that uh, Job's going to curse me if he's physically afflicted. Okay, here's the deal, Satan. You can go down and do whatever you want to him physically. Just don't take his life. What is, what is God establishing there? He's establishing the divine parameters of sovereignty. In other words, I'm going to let you do what you want to do. You're ultimately accomplishing my purpose. You can go this far, but don't go any farther. And so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and he smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a pot share to scrape himself <coughs> while he was sitting among the ashes. That's some suffering there. Then his wife said to him, she, she gives him really good and godly advice. Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. Remember, that's what Satan said was going to happen. Do you think, what, what is it behind her thinking that's kind of controlling that? But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? And all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So here's a prime biblical case of one being turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. For the purposes of vindicating God and ultimately vindicating Job. We see at the very end of this, and we won't go into it now, but Job tells us through all of these trials, through all of this suffering, why it was a good thing that it happened. He said, because he says, I heard thee with the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees thee. Meaning he has a greater understanding of who God is because of this testing. Mark Bailey, who's a professor of Dallas <clears throat> Seminary, said, quote, Pope Paul uh, regarded it best for this sinning Christian as well as best for the church that he leave the church and possibly even die prematurely, assuming that he would not repent. This would have been better than his continuing to live in sin. Sometimes God, because a believer is, is really messing things up here on earth, will say, you know what? That's it for you. Come on home. And they'll use physical death and adversity to end that person's physical life so that his spirit will be delivered. Uh, Jesus himself says that this is the process that, uh, that we as the church should carry out. Before the church was even really the established church, Jesus said, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. And if he listens to you, you've won your brother back. But if he doesn't listen to you, take one or two more, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Tell it to the body of Christ. And if he refuses to leave and even listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile, that is an unbeliever, and a tax collector. Someone who was a Jew, but because of the job that they had and working for uh, Rome, they viewed them as traitors, as turncoats. So needless to say, being viewed as a Gentile or tax collector is not really a good thing. And so what Jesus is saying is if, a, if, a, if an erring brother or sister in Christ refuses to repent after one person goes to them, after several brothers and sisters go to them, and then even after it's brought before the church and they still won't repent, then they are to be regarded as an unbeliever. Now that doesn't mean that we shun them. That doesn't mean that we take them out to the side of the church building and have a rock concert in their honor. That's a euphemism of throwing rocks at the stone then. But it does mean that there is a broken sense of fellowship that we will have with this person. And so that's what Paul says needs to happen. They need to be removed from your midst. Yes, sir. James, it's not hard to understand the turn over to the flesh because that was commonly going on with the Lord's Supper. There were people dying and being mm -hmm. killed by this same manner because of the testimony of the church. Yeah. 
That's right. It is interesting to me that church discipline, I've been involved in church discipline, and the problem with what's hard about church discipline is where's the line at? Mm -hmm. You know, where is the line? You know, I've been involved with uh, somebody gossiping in the church, which created a whole lot of problems. But where, where does this, this is to me the hardest part. This is an obvious blatant sin that even the Gentiles don't participate in. Mm -hmm. But the hard part is if, if a guy's a drunk and, you know, we're, that's to me the hardest part about where, where is the line at? Yeah. Uh, now, the question Jimmy said is because uh, when we look at this, these are good go-bys because if you look at it, he tells you what to do. You have the sinning brother. This is what's to be done. If he refuses to repent, then go to step two. If he refuses to repent, go to step three. If he refuses to repent, go to step four. But how do we know when, just like a fishing hole, how do we know when to, where to put in and where to pull out? Because sin is very messy. And the scripture doesn't give an indication like that. For example, if you were to go get a Texas traffic law book, and it tells you, for the purposes of, you know, Texas Vernon Civil Statute 6701-D, a motor vehicle is defined as, and then subsection A, subsection B, subsection C, subsection C. And if in case you're not clear about that, make subsection C refer to Heading number one, and that's over in a different chapter. I mean, it's just mounds and mounds of laws. Church discipline is not like that. Which leads us to believe that there is a lot of discretionary power for those uh, pastors and elders to engage uh, these individuals. And it should be done on the basis of grace. So in areas where uh, we're not very clear uh, for pastors and elders, and I'm sure... Uh, even in the instances where pastors and elders, those of you have, who have fulfilled that function, uh, if you've ever had to engage in some form of church discipline, uh, realized that uh, in those gray areas, we want to make sure that we administer love and we want to administer grace to those people. Is that what you guys did? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it was always, it's always redemptive, always yes. redemptive. It's always about redemption, right. that you love somebody enough to tell them this is the issues, mm -hmm. and uh, but it is very, very difficult. Yes. When the husband was a godly deacon in the church, and on it went, it, it's a very hard thing to do, and there, that line is hard to find. Yes, sir. I have a question, and I'm not asking this from a legalistic perspective. Mm -hmm. Where's the line that I can dance on? And I know the problem. Right, right. Uh, I'm trying to remember. A lot of us, probably all of us, a couple of our officers are all coming in here as broken people at some point in mm -hmm. time. And, you know, we get saved, we, we make them walk, we get baptized and all that. And then um, a lot of people are coming, particularly this church and churches like this, are coming maybe last week they were in the bar, took the whiskey bottle up, you know, at the fruit joint, whatever. Now they're in here. So in a general sense, maybe in a discussion sense, what kind of things... And what kind of timing are we talking about here when it comes to church discipline? So if I, just use it, you know, save me, if I do this, it's really not an issue of church discipline, but if I do that, it becomes. Mm -hmm. And then if I've been here a week, a month, or a year, it's this, and that's not really church discipline, but I've been here mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years, and I'm doing the same thing, then it's church discipline. Mm -hmm. So how do we, or you, or what's the, how do you, how do you <laughs> muddle through all that? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, how do you determine when someone is going to be uh, or should be subjected to, to discipline, right? That's the fundamental question. Uh, and the answer to that is, uh, I don't know. Uh, no, I, <laughs> to some extent, I can give you a general answer. Okay? A lot of it's going to be dependent upon what the specific sin is. Uh, you know as well as, as most law enforcement officers know, whenever an instructor gets in front of a law enforcement class or an academy class and you begin to deal with issues or matters of law, the number one questions that come up from the audience is, what if, what if, what if, what if? So you're looking at scenarios, and, and in other words, how would we make this law applicable in this specific scenario? Um, and it's generally very difficult to do unless it's very a general question. Because you have to look at the totality of the circumstance. And again, that's what the elders have to do when those types of things are brought before them. Is that there has to be a, a sit down, if you will, uh, to where they talk to uh, all parties involved. Because you, know, you have to determine if 
if in fact a, a, a violation uh, of Scripture has, has been committed, uh, and then you have to be able to, to go to such a one uh, and be sensitive to that person, again, on the basis of love and compassion, and sit down with them and find out if in fact they're violating a biblical ethic, and then do they understand that they're violating the biblical ethic, and then how do we resolve that to get them back on track? So does that help? Sure. Good. Any? Yes, sir. What I understand, if I want to use the word, you're talking more about policies and guidelines versus procedure. You're not going to make exact procedural issue in the exact situation. Right. So you're talking almost like the policy. I, I first comes to mind, shall you continue to see that grace me about? If I see a brother sin and he's willing to repent, I can embrace it and fellowship but mm -hmm. if he continues to sin, then I may not have that fellowship with him. Right. Is that your principle? Yes, the, the, the problem with that specific one when it comes to practical application is very often church discipline is uh, it's already at stage four when it comes to the elders. So it's not a matter of just minor corrective behavior of one on one, because a lot of times when something like that does come to the attention of the church leadership, pastors and elders, uh, it, it, it's a very messy. And so they have to sit down and really think. And so, again, uh, I mean, I make your appeal of Ephesians 6. Where Paul says, you know, bear one another's burdens, which means, you, you know, the, those pastors have to get together. And it's a, often a very messy deal. And here's why. Because no matter the decision that, that the pastors or elders make, generally speaking, on a practical level, someone's not going to be happy. And that's why I said church discipline is always going to be a messy thing. And so the question we should ask is, well, why do we do it? Well, we do it because we're commanded to do it. Because God cares too much about the purity and the sanctity of the church just to make it a social club where we get together and just talk about Jesus once a week. Life is serious business. And we all need to be encouraged and be about the task of growing uh, in our faith. And we're going to have to have some type of an objective standard in order to be able to do that. And there has to be also uh, interactions and sometimes even penalties for those who don't. And again, the purity and the sanctity of the church is the reason why those things are placed in there. Okay. Any other questions? In, in some cases, the, the question is, uh, who's the one who tells? I mean, who's the one who brings it to the attention of the church? In, in a lot of cases, uh, for example, in the, when I was doing the history and the research of church discipline, uh, in the 1700s and the 1800s, with Baptist churches, specifically in the United States, uh, people would tell on themselves. In other words, they would come as a form of counseling to the elders of the church and say, uh, you know, brother so-and-so, I've really been struggling in this specific area. And then the church would immediately embrace him and begin to work on reconciling and correcting the, the behavior and the sin. Uh, in some cases, it's going to be it can be reported. In the case of this specific sin, it was so egregious that it was reported to Paul by people who were members of the church. And, it, and it's not like, you know, they were peeping in someone's bedroom and saying, aha, uh, more likely than not, this man was bringing this woman into the church house. And everyone knew about it. Uh, I mean, there, there's instances like that going on nowadays. Not so much with a person with his stepmother, but we can have people who are coming together who are not married, but who are living together as, as husband and wife. Which if you're, you know... Uh, you look at the distinctions of how some sins impact people in different ways, but both of those would fall under the category of immorality. And so sometimes it can be the case that uh, people will tell on themselves and say, hey, look, I'm struggling in this area and this is what I've done. Uh, in some cases, it's the case that uh, uh, other folks will come and say to the pastor, hey, this is a serious issue and this needs to be dealt with. Now, what's interesting about this particular case is Paul doesn't tell us there is no step one through three mentioned in this passage. Paul doesn't say, OK, look, 
Brother Bill, you need to go to this young man, and if you don't uh, get the problem fixed, then you take two or more with you, and if that doesn't fix it, then take it to the church, and then if the church can't fix it, excommunicate him. Paul immediately goes in for the excommunication. Meaning that there may be some sins that are so egregious that the church must immediately deal with until they can figure the, the, uh, the deal out. And I've seen cases of that. Um, I used to ride in patrol on Sundays. And I've had to make calls at a church where people were arguing over some issue within the church. And you've got uh, Brother Bob who has stood up in church and physically assaulted Brother Bill over here. And now you have his uh, relatives who want to get together against this guy's relatives. And I mean, it, it, it's, it's one big melee. So in that particular instance, I mean, immediate excommunication for, for an offending party is something that would be, would be reasonable, un, reasonable under those circumstances, at least temporarily until you can figure it out. But we see applications of that in the civil law as well. Yes, sir. Well, it's, to me, I'm just hearing you say that, it's going to sound weird, but you'll, it's a use of force claim. There's certain things in my job that I've got to supposedly do before I put somebody on the ground softly or, or not so softly. But it's always tempered with if the situation allows. Right. So you can go straight to number 10 and that's all the situation will allow. So if, if what's going on is so crazy and insane and dangerous and whatever that you don't do all that other stuff, mm -hmm. you just go step 10. And nobody has a problem with it as long as you right. justify the fact right. that this is why I had to do it this way. Yes. No, he's talking about uh, uh, in, in relating a job from and again, this is something that people working in law enforcement can identify with because you're looking at a, like a force continuum, if you will. You can go from step one to step ten if the circumstances dictate that you can. That uh, that's something that's reasonable to do. Uh, the same thing that we see here. Of course, the one advantage that we do have, and this is why I'm not overly confident and always uh, real quick to whip this out as a model, is because, number one, it is the Apostle Paul who's mandating that this is the way that this matter of church discipline be done. Okay? He's one who is acting under apostolic authority. So that's, that's different from us doing it today. I mean, I know there are people out there who call themselves apostles. But what I'm talking about is there... Paul is acting under apostolic authority as one specific commissioned by the Lord Jesus to, uh, to do what he's doing. And he's telling the church under apostolic authority to remove this, this one. Um, but even then, the ultimate objective is still the same. Whether it's to be done with steps one through four or whether he's going immediately to step four, the end result is the same. We want to see restoration and repentance with this young man. Yes, James, sir. I know we're running out of time, but this to me is a very important passage because moving forward with same-sex marriage, it is going to become a not only a moral issue, but a legal yeah. issue, I think, for the churches. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll close with this. Uh, we'll, I'll hold this until next time we get together. Um, he, he said this is going to be a bigger issue uh, the more and more that we have in reference to same-sex marriages. Uh, with people who are advocate, advocating that type of lifestyle uh, coming in uh, and suing the churches and so forth. And, and that's true. Oppression is going to come. There's a lot of pastors who, who will skip over this specific chapter because it, it can be very divisive. I mean, look around in here today. There's less people in here today than there normally is. Now, I'm not saying it's because that they didn't want to deal with the issues of church discipline, but with the minute that you mention church discipline, the little hairs on the backs of people's necks stand up. Because it's something that impacts both congregations and, and as well as pastors. You know, I, I, I think reminded of, of two great pastors in church histories uh, that, that had conflicts with their congregations over this issue. One of them was Jonathan Edwards. The, he is known as America's greatest theologian, or the, the best theologian America's ever produced. I mean, his works are mind-numbing. The, the things he was able to write as a young man. He was the pastor of the church at Northampton, okay? For over 20 years, faithfully serving God. And he tried to teach his congregation that by saying, folks, when it comes to the Lord's table and the elements are passed, this is an in-house 
type of fellowship. In other words, we don't let babies and little children partake of the elements. Only those who are professing Jesus as Lord and Savior and who have been baptized into the family of God, those are the ones who are eligible to partake of the elements. Of course, his congregation, who had been taught by Edwards' grandfather, allowed children to partake of the elements because in Presbyterian theology, one comes into the covenant community by baptism and they practice infant baptism. Thus, if you put their theology together, two and two equals four. And so that was a source of conflict for, between Edwards and his congregation. So much so that it finally came to a head that Edwards came in one Sunday morning uh, preached his last sermon and then was subsequently dismissed by his congregation by a vote of over 90% after he had faithfully served them for over 20 years. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Now he didn't leave Northampton with sour grapes. He looked at it as an opportunity. As all pastors and preachers will have to eventually do this as we are being faced with more opposition from out in the world who are now going to be coming in and opposing God's truth. Pastors will have to take a stand or fall. Another great pastor was that of John Calvin who came to Geneva. As he was passing through, he was going to continue on until he was confronted by one of the city elders and said, you know, uh, you know, hey, Calvin, I know you want to go and you want to be this great scholar and write stuff, but we need a pastor here. And Calvin said, no, I really don't want to do it. And the city elder said, you know what, if you miss this opportunity and you just abandon this city and the people in it who need a pastor, God's going to curse you. You're never going to have a minute's peace. And guess what? Calvin was so terrified by that admonition that he decided to stay and be their pastor. He preached faithfully the Word of God expositionally, book after book, week after week. Until there became another moral issue in the church that he had to deal with. The people and even the citizens there in Geneva said, you know what, we've had enough of this. And they fired John Calvin from the pulpit. And he left. Three years later, they had begged him to come back. When he came back, the very next Sunday that he came back, you know what he did? He said, if you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn with me back over into the book of so-and-so. And he said, now let us begin with the next verse. Three years later, that was what Calvin did. The reason I told you that or tell you that about these men is this. God may bring opposition to the church. God may allow opposition to be in the church. But regardless of whether it comes from the outside or it comes from the inside, the pastors and the elders, those who have charge of having oversight over the congregation, okay, they have to stand strong. They have to stand on the Word of God regardless of the opposition, regardless of how they may be viewed and regardless of how the world may see them. Their commitment has to be to the Lord Jesus Christ and to His Word. And if pastors are willing to do that, though church discipline may at sometimes be messy, what great joy there is in heaven to see the restored brother or sister who is welcomed back into the fold, who grows stronger because of the incident that happened, but most importantly, that the integrity and the purity of the church is maintained. That's our goal. That's why we do church discipline. Well, when we come back next time, we'll put back up with verse 6 and look at the standard that Paul uses for the administration of God's discipline. Let's pray.